Life Issues with Vicky Gibbons on UCB One. Children's fictional adventures like Peter Pan and Captain Hook, as well as Hollywood productions such as Pirates of the Caribbean, have embedded for many of us the idea a life at sea might be all adventure and treasure seeking. But for a moment, let's cast aside the eye patches, the headscarves, and the parrots to discover what a job on the high seas really entails. I'm Vicky Gibbons, and in today's Life Issues, I'm joined by Jan Weber, BEM, who's the Director of Development at the Mission to Seafarers. Also here from the charity, but not based in the UK, instead Richards Bay in South Africa, Port Chaplain Mark Classen. Jan, congratulations. You were recently awarded the British Empire Medal for services to women in the international maritime sector. You were well placed to describe to us then who a modern seafarer might be. Uh, Well, first of all, thank you. And thank you for welcoming Mark and I onto your program. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and to share the work of the Mission to Seafarers um, with you. Um, seafaring is is quite an invisible um, profession. Um, the general public um, don't tend to don't tend to realise the role that seafarers play in their everyday lives. But to directly answer your question of what is a seafarer is that a seafarer is just a normal person who wants to go to sea to pursue a career and to provide for his or her family. So in the past, we've had um, seafarers from from the UK. Um, those have declined over the over the years, and more and more seafarers are coming from developing nations such as the Philippines. Um, they come from India and also from China. So they 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 just want to provide a better. Certainly, Filipinos want to provide a better life for their families at home. Help us understand then, Jan, when it comes to all that we receive in terms of goods and produce, how much of an impact does the maritime sector have, particularly here in the UK? It's absolutely huge um, because more than 90% of our goods and fuels come by sea. And as an island nation, we are very dependent upon it. I know that um, the haulage industry is quite visible and you see the lines of um, lorries going through Dover, but that is a mere fraction of what we import. If you, you like me, are experiencing delays at the moment for goods that you've ordered, it's because they're all coming in through the ports and that there are log jams in the ports at the moment, which is causing um, one of the factors that are causing delays. Well, maybe we can explore some of those factors then, because there was already anticipation of what Brexit would bring. Add on to that the last couple of years with the pandemic. Describe exactly how those variables have been impacting when we see scenes of lorry drivers stuck queuing and wondering where our latest order that we've posted online is going to come. Yeah, this is such a big topic and uh, it's a bit of a... Uh, a dilemma as to where to start. Well, the um, the pandemic hit seafarers um, really hard. Um, if you can cast your mind back to the two years back and to think that all of a sudden um, that flights were stopped, borders were, were closed and seafarers were on their ships, a seafarer would typically spend nine months on board a ship. And during that time, he would have opportunity to come ashore. And that's when um, our chaplains like Mark would go and visit them, at, um, visit them when they come ashore. But there was um, significant curtailment of shore leave. That continues now is that um, shore leave is very limited. So the seafarers, when they came to the end of their contracts, were asked to renew their contracts. Those that did manage to get off the ships, and I I made a note in preparation for this meeting, um, to, to, I had a vision, I had a, a, um, I saw a picture of seafarers coming ashore in Singapore, and they were going through the airport, and they were dressed in these Hamzat suits, which was just um, quite impactful at the beginning of the of uh, of the pandemic, 
so consequently, um, they've been limited in their shore leave. They've been on board ships for a long period of time, some of them as long as 22 months. And you can imagine if you, uh, you run out of supplies, medication, uh, food, hygiene, uh, hygiene products, um, then those, those you can't just stop, pop to the corner shop to get those. And that's what our chaplains and what Mark has been doing a lot of is um, providing that um, that they're shopping for for seafarers, but also supporting them as they um, spend so much time with a small crew on board a ship. Mark, we all can at least understand what lockdown has been like from our own perspective in our homes. But as Jan makes the point, many of us were still able to go out at least once a day to get essential shopping, to be stuck on a a ship for that long. And Mark, maybe you can just describe the enormity of these cargo ships for anyone who perhaps hasn't been near them or upon one of these vessels. So firstly, thank you, Vicky, again, for allowing uh, me to be part of this broadcast, along with Jen. It's an absolute privilege. So they are stuck on board the ship for months on on end, and uh, they are not allowed shore leave Officially, yeah, in South Africa, shore leave is allowed, but there is such a long process that uh, they opt not to, or the company would prefer not to risk their seafarers uh, to the to the pandemic. Um, captains as well have uh, quite blanche to decide on that. Um, yeah, you know, in in Richards Bay, in the port of Richards Bay, uh, we do allow. Uh, vaccinations of seafarers. Um, so that is a chance for them uh, to come ashore and they'll go and get their vaccinations and use that opportunity to buy some uh, takeaway like McDonald's or KFC or something, uh, which yeah, I didn't realize that they, they really love uh, and miss so much. Um, but yeah, when we go to you know the ships, uh, different types, uh, different sizes, um, and we are basically, when we go and visit them on board and we, we speak to them and we listen to uh, their concerns and their needs, you know, we've realized that we basically are their voice, their hands and their feet. Voice in terms of when there are some problems uh, that we need to try and help with. Um, and obviously their hands and feet. Uh, go and buy some some essentials, you know, like uh, just for example, toothbrush, uh, toothpaste, and uh, shampoo. That's essential for them. Uh, but also, a, a lot of them require medicines, um, you know, ones that don't need a prescription. Um, and so, we I've, I've got wonderful testimonies. But yeah, that is uh, that is a big requirement from them. And I tell you, uh, Vicky, the attitude in the seafarers when we are able to to help them that way. Um, of course, with the seafarer, and I'm sure you, um, when you've traveled before, you've realized that when you want to, uh, when you arrive in a new country, the first thing that you want to do is make contact with your family back home just to ensure them that you are safe um, and that you're there. And so, the, therefore, communication, a SIM card and some airtime is key for them. Since the pandemic, however, Mission to Seafarers has, has been wonderful. We've uh, embarked on this MAFA uh, project where, where we give them a basically a router and um, they can use that to contact their families back home. This was all done out of an appreciation, uh, not only to the funders, but also to the seafarers for the extended period uh, of contract, you know, like Jay mentioned, some 22 months, my brother-in-law, he's a bosun on the ship, um, yeah, he was he was on board for 18 months. Um, uh, you know, so he showed me a picture of his daughter before and after and, yeah, totally different. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was extended periods of time on, on, on board. Um, yeah, so we were out of appreciation, we said thank you. You know, they went, you know, so they went to let like, crew change um, to say thank you. And we still do it too. We still, we still have MAFA units here in Richards Bay, the Port of Richards Bay, as well as Durban and, um, and in Port Elizabeth, um, also in Mombasa. 
Um, so we we offer these MAFI units to to the crew if they don't already have SIM cards, and they're very very grateful. Mark, you said part of your role is sometimes to help with problems that occur for the crew. Is that often between crew and their employers and some of the issues around rights that they have? So yes, Vicky, we, we deal quite a bit with justice and welfare issues. Uh, we we are an organisation that offers pastoral care. Um, so we won't necessarily get into the thick of it, into the legal aspect, but we do partner uh, with certain maritime organisations um, like the ITF, uh, International Transport Workers Federation. And, and in terms of local context, um, yeah, in South Africa, we have what you call the South African Maritime Safety Association, SAMHSA for short. They uh, are normally there for the safety of the vessel, but um, you know, they've uh, for a while now they've gone deeper and further into uh, making sure that the crew are, are well looked after as well. Uh, I, I recall quite a serious incident, um, you know, just into the pandemic uh, back in June, July, and August 2020, a year in Port of Richards Bay. There was a ship with multiple problems, and um, you know, so SAMHSA was involved. Um, I was there along with my colleagues to, you know, to care for them pastorally. I also recall uh, one evening till just after midnight in the pouring rain on the quayside, trying to counsel a uh, Bulgarian third mate. Um, you know, so this is what we do, but we collaborate nicely uh, with the uh, the legal authority in, in this regard. Jan, you said at the start of this conversation that this is an industry so often invisible. And yet last year, it made the headlines because of what happened with Ever Given, that huge container ship that blocked the Suez Canal last March. What did you make of that incident at the time? That, that, uh, that was incredible, wasn't it? And we did see the picture of that tiny digger that was trying to dig the hull of the um, Ever Given out of the, um, su- the banks of the Suez Canal. And <clears throat> I think that really gave us all um, a feeling of perspective as to how vast these ships are. And, uh, and, and we know how tiny the crews are on board. It it highlighted the vulnerability um, of the supply chain as well, um, as we saw the um, build-up of ships on either end of the Suez Canal, this vital piece of waterway. Um, so it it I suppose it's a double-edged sword. It d- really did raise the profile of the seafarers on board. Um, and it raised, it made people realise the importance of seafarers in that um, in that situation. So we, it certainly attracted attention from um, the bigger retail industry companies that had previously not been in touch with us, as they realised the the uh, how precarious it was and the impact of something like that in a major waterway could have on the supply of their goods. So many ships in the in, in initial stages um, actually made the decision to um, uh, to redirect and come round past Richards Bay and round um, past Cape Town and, and the, the long way, what they call the long way round, um, round Africa, South Africa. and But that adds um, a lot of time and a lot of expense to, um, to the goods that they're transporting and, uh, and causes significant delays. But the crew on board that ship, and um, we did help the crew on board that ship. Uh, our regional director flew from from Dubai to um, to Egypt to help with that crew. They they felt that the world was looking at them and that it was their fault when actually not all the facts were known and what the causes were, um, and there were a number of factors involved with this that. Uh, um, that were are reported in the press. We then supported that crew as they came um, through the Mediterranean and into Rotterdam and then into Felixstowe. So that's 
that's the beauty of um, the Mission to Seafarers extensive network across the world, that we're in 200 ports and 50 countries. It does mean that um, we're able to support the crew, uh, not only in one, one port, but when they when they move along to subsequent ports. And clearly we're not in everyone, uh, in every port um, around the world, but um, but we are in, in a great many that we do come into contact with, with more and more seafarers. And Mark, what has it been like to use technology like this, the way that you can now more easily connect? When we go to a vessel, uh, we will log on to the app and we will do our ship visit and we will speak to whoever it is. We will help in whichever way we can. And after the, after the visit, what we'll do is we'll go into the app and we will then select the name of the ship. We will, what you call, add to schedule. It just makes it um, able to put any comments there. Uh, you will include how many crew is on board that vessel, uh, the nationality, uh, the amount of, e- of each, and then you can then add your experience. What was it like? So, who, for example, who did you speak to? So, for example, you say, I had a wonderful chat to the chief mate. He shared a little bit about his family, um, battling, missing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah, then you'll also share on the app. There's a section where you can add the resources that we gave them. For example, a Indonesian Bible, um, you know, a few tracks. Uh, etc sim cards uh, groceries gift items a lot of our seafarers are catholic so we'll perhaps you know, give them a rosary or or you know some, something like that um and it you know, we can just say there um you know what it was like for our visit um the wonderful thing about this app is that if we have started a a counseling session for example if we'd heard something specifically sensitive from one of the seafarers, we can add it as discreetly as possible to the app. And then the chaplain in the next port, when he picks up his app and he does his prep work, and then that chaplain in that destination port will find this log that I just did in the previous port, they will see that uh, chaplain Mark spoke to uh, Mr. Boson, for example, and this was the issue, then then you, that chaplain can follow up, can pick up that, you know, where the counselling was left uh, was left off. And uh, I get, I've got, you know, many times I've got surprised looks, like, how do you know my life? <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you, you know, we, 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 we do it very sensitively, um, very discreetly, and just the, uh, the immense amount of appreciation that people are caring for them. Vicky, I can't express to you the level of exploitation that happens uh, with seafarers you know, by other organisations, other individuals, um, what have you. And then here's, here's somebody who... Um, who's called the flying angel. Um, that's the endearing term for the mission to see first chaplains. Um, he is a flying angel and uh, showing care, wanting to give something, not wanting to take something. That's that's incredible for them and you know, um, immense amount of appreciation. And Mark, share with us a bit more about how you have felt called to specifically be a port chaplain as well, because you've described there that for some seafarers, they do have a personal faith. For others, I imagine it's an opportunity to share more about the gospel and particularly how relevant Jesus is, given that he called uh, fishermen to be disciples. That's correct. So you, you, you're right, Vicky. We, we don't um, only deal with Christians. Um, you know, we do. We deal with uh, every other religion. Um, in in my this is my t- in, I'm into my ten years uh, with the mission to Seafarers. I've dealt with 120 different nationalities, and obviously, along with those are different cultures, religions, uh, etc., languages. Um, so yeah, so I've dealt with um, atheists. Um, uh, Muslims, uh, Hindus, uh, Buddhists, etc., etc. Uh, so it definitely is 
a, a, a wonderful platform to be able to share this to share the gospel. It isn't always easy. I, I must be honest, Becky, uh, because especially when you, you uh, arrive on a show um, and whatever other religion it is, um, and you you know you gently move into it. We don't we don't just you know, come <laughs> crashing down with the word. Um, you gently move into it, and uh, especially when they're in the group, you will not find um, approachable crew. Um, you know, you, they will immediately uh, shut down um, and, mo- and move off, you know. But it is very possible when you're able to get one or two people aside. Um, you, know, you ask the question, you say, uh, you know, I have... Uh, Christian material in this specific language. Is there anybody here that would like? Um, because we have heard that we that they are, and yeah, and then sometimes you'll get a yes or just a blunt no. Um, but yeah, again, I've I have some wonderful testimonies of uh, I've had, for example, two Turkish crew in in the chapel at the Sifra Center asking for holy Bibles in in. In Turkish, um, I've had six Hindus participate in a communion service. So you know, so it is it is out there. The uh, and that's wonderful. You know, as chaplains, I must also add, Vicky, that you know we uh, we are all pastors and we are there for the spiritual well-being, of course, of the seafarer, uh, not only the emotional, the psychological, the um, you know the practical help, uh, but our role is to pastor. Um, so when we can have that instance where we can meet them on that level, that's wonderful. So that's really, really fulfilling that we can worship the Lord together with people from different languages, different countries, different cultures. Mark, your linguistic skills must be far more advanced than mine dealing with more than 100 different languages like you've been sharing there but Jan I mean Mark has been explaining about diversity of religions what about diversity in terms of gender within the maritime sector the maritime sector is um, very male dominated Um, so for um, for seafarers only two percent of seafarers are women and um, the majority of those women serve on ferries or cruise ships um, and not on um, tankers or bulkers or liners. It does, uh, the industry is working hard and ha- certainly has done over the, the past few years, working hard to encourage more women to go to sea. Um, there are significant challenges both for men and women if there are women on board a ship. Um, but uh, the, many of the um, highly reputable companies that operate um, in ship management and crewing, they really do um, um, make make significant amendments so that they uh, so that women can can feel comfortable on board a ship. So I give give you an example of of some things that are overlooked is the is the actual um, clothes that they wear the um, these uh, like boiler suits that they wear and the helmets and the life vests um, they're not all made for a female frame there sometimes is uh, overlooked is the the sort of sanitary provision for women and certainly that that became an issue during. During the pandemic, when um, uh, when seafarers couldn't get ashore and do do their shopping, and I'm sure um, I don't want to make Mark blush, but I'm sure that those those may may have been things that were included in his shopping list on occasions. Um, <laughs> <Indeed>. But <laughs> um, so so I think, but I, there are many career opportunities for women. I, I I've never been to sea. But I, I so enjoy the industry I work in. It's so varied and so, so interesting that if you don't see that life at sea is something that, that you are called to do, um, there is certainly so much variety. And um, I, I love the job that I do because I, I work across the world and I, um, it has impact. You, know, you learn more about your geography, more about economics, um, 
trade and the legal side of it, human rights. Um, there, there are so many fascinating elements to the job. And so you're getting the job satisfaction of learning new things alongside being able to provide for this invisible and vulnerable workforce. Um, and if you can imagine, if you, you arrive in a new country, if you're on your own and you arrive in a new country, and um, we've all done this as, as, you know, you don't know where to go perhaps. Um, but when, if, you, if you align that to a seafarer coming into a new country, a new port, having limited time ashore, and going back to what Mark said about exploitation is that many, um, many ports are remote and um, seafarers will need to get a taxi perhaps to, to go to where they want to go. And what the mission provides is all of our uh, um, chaplains and ship visitors um, would have access to transport to transport the seafarers where they need to go. And that also pre presents uh, uh, an ideal opportunity to um, uh, to talk to them. But uh, I do hope that um, more women will come forward and consider a career either at sea or on, on shore because there is there's so much opportunity, and companies are, are um, encouraging this this to happen. Jan, in terms of diversifying, then. What do you think are some of the barriers still, this perception of it being a masculine industry, of that need of resilience and it being quite a tough terrain to be in on the high seas? Do you think all of that imagery still acts as one of potentially many barriers to the industry for women? Well, I, there is no doubt that it's a tough environment um, to work in and uh, you're surrounded by a mechanized environment. It's a harsh environment. Um, but many women um, are, uh, um, are training as engineers and navigators and captains. And um, they, I, I think that women uh, can see that and can see that it's a, a harsh environment. And for those, it's, it, it's perhaps not for them. But for others, they, they want to embrace that and to follow a career at sea. Um, with all these things, it, it does really start in the classroom, doesn't it? When, and, the, um, and at colleges, uh, um, uh, in the dim and distant past, when I was at school, and you know, career career choices were very limited. But if if you're not aware of the industry, then you're not going to um, you're not going to consider it as a career. So it may be that uh, th throughout life, um, you come into contact with someone who um, who has been to sea or someone working in the industry who encourages you to consider um, that as a career. But the, the, the shipping industry has worked really hard to, uh, to encourage uh, um, people into a career at sea and certainly women into a career at sea. Um, but it's, it, it, it's very rewarding, I'm sure, if, 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 it's, if it's something that um, appeals to you. And you're speaking today, having been recognised, of course, with a British Empire Medal for services to women in the international maritime sector. Uh, looking back on the many years that you have been a part of this sector, Mark mentioned before this idea of the ways in which seafarers are exploited. Do you think conditions have worsened or are they about the same as when you started? Oh, that's definitely improved, definitely improved over the years. And um, Mark might, might well have another view from, from where he sits at the, working at the front line. But um, from my viewpoint, um, it's definitely improved. And uh, I, I entered the industry in 2005 and uh, uh, there's still, uh, shore side, there's still a, a lot of white males in their 60s. And, um, but there are a lot more women now uh, being visible, certainly shore side. And um, I've been to dinners where I was one of a handful of women amongst hundreds of men. Um, but now the proportion has definitely, uh, definitely changed and more and more women 
are are seeing a career in the industry, but there's still a phenomenal phenomenal way to go um, because of um, you know the figures speak for themselves. Of only two percent of women uh, of seafarers are women, so uh, that that the figures speak for themselves, really. Jan, what about advancements around human rights and the issue of of piracy and some of the other ways in which Mission to Seafarers very much is an advocate for the realities that seafarers are facing? The human rights aspect of it is is deplorable. Um, I think, again, there have been improvements, but there's a long way to go. Um, and our regional director in um, Dubai has been involved in a, in a lot of abandonments. You may recall the um, the ship that um, broke its anchor and ended up in the beach in, in Dubai. And uh, there was this incongruous picture of a massive ship um, alongside people sitting in deck chairs on the beach drinking their gin and tonics. So I think it was... It, it it was a very visible reminder of um, the issues that seafarers face when they are abandoned, and um, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, but they can be abandoned for uh, years. We've had um, a, a regional director has helped seafarers who have been on rusting hulks out at sea, cooking on open fires on the deck. Wait, um, relying on um, on um, fishing for food and the local chap the chaplain or a passing ship to give them water, and the reason why they stay on board the ship is because they are paid they are due their wages, and um, if they leave the ship, then they uh, forfeit their wages. So we we work very closely with them and with the authorities to come to a resolution whereby they can rep- be repaid what what is owed them. We have seen this year the outrage of what happened to the crews with P&O ferries. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury saying the firm's actions treated human beings as commodity of no basic value or dignity. How prevalent is it an isolated case or how prevalent are those kind of attitudes within the industry itself? I, I've certainly not heard of a, a, a mass um, redundancy like that. And I don't know whether Mark has in his years. So I think that it it is certainly, certainly an unusual case and certainly for 800 crew to be treated like that in that way. And to be where they are within a, a, a UK port, they're very visible to us, of course, that this is happening. Mark, what did you think when you heard about what had happened and in the manner of the, the way that the crew were treated? Yeah, you know, Vicky, it's obviously it's, it's a very, very sad thing. But, you know, um, I've, I've dealt with so many, so many harsh cases you know, with seafarers. I, I, I deal with them uh, locally and uh, seafarers that contact me from abroad. Um, you know, a lot of companies are very kind, uh, very accommodating, very understanding um, and appreciate their crews. But the reality is that there are many that do not mm-hmm. from just the basics of, of not providing the provisions, what we call provisions, it's groceries, basically, um, you know, to not paying their salaries for for months on end. Um, I, I had uh, a few years ago an abandoned vessel year where the, the ship hobbled in. Um, it wasn't in a good state, um, seaworthy was, um, but the crew had not been paid for six months. The, the, the chief cook showed me his freezer. Um, there was r- rotting fish and all the vegetables, nothing else. So, uh, unfortunately, it does happen, and that, but that's why the mission to seafarers is here. You know, to to make sure that we are there to care for seafarers, especially when they land up in that situation again, where others will not really do anything without sort of getting paid for it. Um, you know, we, we'll go in there and we'll care for them. Um, in with that specific example I mentioned. Um, 
There were 15 Ukrainian crew. Um, I, I rallied the support of the community. They they gave us uh, one specific big uh, supermarket franchise. They gave a donation of 10,000 rands worth of groceries. And we got some of the community members to also offer groceries, uh, airtime. Um, yeah, so the reality is, Vicky, that it, it does happen, not to this not to that scale, you know, um, uh, or what, you know, it's just, various just happen now there, but uh, it does happen. It, it does happen. Mark, I know you shared quite a bit about the, the way in which you respond to the physical needs of seafarers, but what of their welfare when it comes to a mental health perspective, remembering the isolation that they endure for so many months? Yes, that's very important uh, to note, Vicky, you know, we, we go on board um, not, to, not to expect any um, sad news, but, you know, not to be surprised when, when we do. Um, so, you know, the, especially during the, when at the heart of the pandemic, when, when they were not allowed to go home uh, after how many months, more than a year on board, when there was no crew change, no vaccinations allowed, things were very, very tough. And, and uh, one of the platforms that the Mission to Seafarers and ECMA, International Christian Maritime Association, came up with is a, an online platform called Chat to a Chaplain. Because also right in the beginning, even chaplains were not allowed to go to the ships. Yeah, and specifically in the Port of Richards Bay, for two months, we, we basically sat at home. But that's when we started what we call, what we phrase digital chaplaincy, is that we still connect with the seafarer, but through social media. And that was, that was wonderfully accepted, by the way, by seafarers to know that there are still people out there caring for them, caring for their well being, their mental state, um, uh, you know, to reach out to them. The chat to a chaplain platform I was speaking about, it, it, it does the same. There are a number of uh, online counselors, chaplains who will you know, be, be there just to offer an encouraging word, trying to give hope. There were numerous problems. Obviously, the biggest thing was there that those who were on board couldn't come ashore. And so obviously family missing them. But on the other side of the coin, there were many seafarers sitting at home with no opportunity to get a contract. You can imagine um, the repercussions. There's no salary coming in. Families are starving. Um, etc. Uh, the Mission to Seafarers also came up with the initiative of the Family Networks back in 2016. So uh, they are groups of people that will reach out to the families of the seafarers. We, Because we realised back then, by the way, Vicky, that we're not only dealing with the seafarer, we're dealing with a person who has a family, who is, for example, a, a wife or or, or the son, uh, you know, so in, we felt that in order to care for them, we need to care for them completely, holistically, in every aspect. And so that's why we started an initiative to, uh, with the family network to reach out to the family. So currently we, uh, we have a family network in the Philippines, in Myanmar, in India, and in the Ukraine where families can uh, connect with the local Mission to Seafarers office there um, and then get some more information on the seafaring um, and be a source of help um, when something does happen. Because if you can imagine, with the seafarer being thousands of miles away from their homes, from their loved ones, uh, can you imagine the worry um, that, you know, that they experience, so to, to know that there are people caring for their families, uh, it has alleviated um, you know, a, a lot of the mental stress. Mark, it's amazing to hear how you've adapted and how Missions has obviously digitised chaplaincy during the pandemic as well. But I know that you've had to respond to natural disasters as well. Tell us about responding to the Typhoon Odette. Oh, that was very sad because I was um, you know, directly uh, affected because I have family in the Philippines. My, my wife is from the Philippines and specifically from the island that was uh, mostly affected, which is the island of Bohol. In fact, um, most of her siblings had lost their homes. Uh, fortunately, no lives but a lot of them lost their homes. There was washed away. Um, 
the brother-in-law that I referred to early on in the beginning, uh, fortunately he was on board, but yeah, he sent me pictures of what his house looked like. And obviously I saw the pictures of the devastation elsewhere. But in terms of how we reached out, um, so we obviously we, we received uh, many seafarers, you know, sadness and everything when we went on board. Um, and so what we did uh, for those especially deeply affected uh, we offered them either that free MAFA unit that I spoke about or um, others we offered a free SIM card and some airtime just to uh, just to be able to connect. Unfortunately, communication wasn't up for a long time. Uh, I stand corrected, but I think uh, the communication only came up about two weeks, uh, three weeks after that. Um, but, yeah, so they, they did you know, get information, uh, you know, through other sources. Uh, but that was one way that we thought we could help. We did something similar back in 2013 when uh, Typhoon New London hit as well. Uh, the mission to seafarers actually is an issue. It was their initiative to offer some cards and uh, free airtime. So, uh, so that's the way we helped. But, you know, we obviously we were able to offer a listening ear again, um, you know, to try and give hope. Uh, we, we always share about those family networks there. Um, so, yeah, there's one specific captain that we helped uh, last year in November. Um, he, he was repatriated on the 1st of January this year, and yeah, he went back uh, to devastation, but has since started a fund in order to try and help his fellow seafarers and his family on the island of Bohol. More vital than ever, especially when you reflect on what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Perhaps people think, you know, does that really have an impact isolated to the country of Ukraine on the maritime sector? What would you say to that? Well, it's, it's a big topic again, isn't it? Is you know the the port of Odessa uh, is ab- absolutely crucial to um, Ukraine and Mariupol too. Uh, aren't they brave people? All the all holding out for so long in uh, in such annihilation. It it, it is so dreadful um, that civilians are being targeted in this way. Um, so. Um, uh, all of um, or the majority of the crops from Ukraine pass through um, Odessa. It's an absolutely critical port for um, for the economic welfare of Ukraine, and um, and the the Russians know that, so that's on their target list. But uh, um, yes, yeah, so it's we have been helping the the crews of the ships that have been in the Black Sea. Um, uh, several of them have called into um, into Turkey, and we have a, a chaplain in Turkey um, who has been offering assistance. We've also um, been approached by companies who are um, bringing their seafarers and their seafaring families out of Ukraine into Moldova, Romania, Poland, um, and Bul- Bulgaria. So we're we're, we're working with with um, a particular company that is bringing the seafarers into Bulgaria. So we'll, we'll as- assess the need and, and support them as much as we can. As individuals, when we are the beneficiaries of so much that is brought to us by the maritime sector and the global supply chain through such huge cargo vessels, as well as your smaller, medium-sized vessels as well, what is our role to play in this, in how we can support those involved in the sector? You know, being on the front line as a chaplain, uh, yes, uh, my most um, primary uh, role is to be there for seafarers, to uh, to meet them on the ships wherever they, wherever they are, um, to also meet them at the hospital, because yeah, that's something that uh, you know that a lot of people don't know. You know, we're not only ship visitors. We wherever we find a seafarer, uh, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a quarantine facility, even in prison, uh, we we have to be there for them. Uh, if we say we're caring for seafarers, then we need to be where where they are. And and many times, you know, if we are not, I like to say that if we are not visiting them we we've got no opportunity to help them and, and this is what we're here for we our slogan says caring for seafarers around the world 
And that is what we need to be doing. So as a chaplain, a primary role for me is to raise the profile of the CFO. So I preach in many churches. I do community uh, presentations. Uh, I am part of the uh, Yacht Club here locally in Richards Bay. Um, but also even if I do weddings and if I do memorial services, uh, it is an opportunity for me to raise the profile of the seafarer as well. Like just now on Saturday, I did a memorial service for a, a local uh, retired chief engineer. So uh, so that's a primary role um, to, you know, to raise the, the profile of of the, the seafarer as, as well as the, the work that the mission to seafarers does uh, for them. And yes, uh, because we are a charity organization, uh, we, we do always uh, appreciate uh, when uh, the hearts of uh, the community is opened. I'm very fortunate here. Yeah, I, I have a great network here of people who support us, um, not only individuals, but also organizations. Um, so it, it's really great. It means that we can do more for seafarers. So if we can build on that uh, and uh, start it around the world where there, where there isn't that uh, support, uh, it will only mean that seafarers are cared for more. You've been listening to Life Issues on UCB with Mark Classen, Port Chaplain at Richards Bay in South Africa, along with Jan Weber, BEM, Director of Development at Mission to Seafarers. Thank you both, Jan and Mark, for being our guests today. It's been a privilege and an insight into the maritime industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to appear on your programme. Yes, thank you very much, Vicky. After listening to this, why not read Psalm 107? There's a great reflection about those who went on the sea in ships, the storm they faced and their gladness for God, providing calm and guiding them to a safe haven. As we've heard, storms seen and unseen for seafarers can develop beyond dealing with the high waves. You know, every July, Sea Sunday might be a practical opportunity for us to share more about the Flying Angels and how they help those involved in transporting our goods and fuels around the world. Thank you for listening to this episode of Life Issues. Make sure you subscribe to the series or access more episodes for free via the UCB Player app.